When did you find the story and, and, and how? Like, when did it all start for you? This all started in uh, February of 1996. I was, um, I was a newly on the staff at the Houston Chronicle. Um, I, uh, our medical writer was taking a trip with a team from Texas Children's Hospital to Romania. Mm -hmm. And she came in and um, asked our director of photography, hey, I need a freelancer next week in Bucharest. Well, my boss knew that, you know, here at the Dallas Morning News, William Snyder had won a Pulitzer Prize for his work in Romania a few years earlier, about five years earlier. And, um, and so my boss was like, yeah, there's pictures, this is real. Could I just send somebody? Could I send, to, instead of a freelancer, could I send one of my own people? And she's like, well, yeah, I mean, I don't see a problem with that. You know, he's like, how much is the plane ticket? I was outside, you know, typing some captions or turning out some, you know, random assignment a day. And, you know, my boss, because this was a different era in newspaper, and came in and said, you, Bucharest, next week. And the next thing I knew, I was on a plane to Bucharest with this team of doctors from Texas Children's. One member of the team was Dr. Mark Klein, who was, I believe at the time, making his first international trip as well. He's a pediatric um, infectious disease specialist. And he sees the disparity in the access to care with this large group in Romania, where they were um, you know, dying in great numbers. So on our way back, Mark, one of the Tom Brotherton, who organized the trip, asked everybody who had been on the trip to write down three things you're going to do about what you've seen. You know, it was a fact-finding trip, and, and, you know, one of mine was, you know, I'm going to get the story published, um, I'm going to honor the people I photographed, and I'm not going to give up. Three things, three lines. Um, I didn't realize where that was going to take me. Um, Mark Klein filled up a legal pad across the aisle on the, air, on the airplane, and he hatched this thing which is now the Baylor International Pediatric AIDS Initiative. Yeah, I guess I did. But this is, has become more than just getting a story published for you. This it, has become your life's work. For me, I had, for one of the first times in journalism, participated in something, in telling a story that had actually had that impact. This is something that we know in journalism. Sometimes you have a story, sometimes you have a series of editorials that wins a Pulitzer Prize for the Dallas Morning News that changes policy and changes lives and changes them for the better. It's the first time I'd ever involved in something when you're shooting football that now the pictures had done something, had contributed, and at that point I'm hooked. You have covered all kinds of major stories, but this one has really hooked you. I believe through my, from, through my learned experience in this job, I think the world is a better place when we help connect people to other people whose lives they can be inspired by. I've personally been inspired by these lives, and my hope is that by sharing their stories that it might inspire someone else's life through their example. And so, and in the process of doing that, you know, they become your friends. And so there, there are moments where, you know, we talk about, there's, there's ethical challenges, and, you know, professional distance, and I'm, and I'm dealing with medical professionals and learning about professional distance within the aspect of medical professionals. You know, in order to do it effectively, you have to maintain some sort of, you know, you know, lines that you don't cross, and those lines become very difficult to see when you are, when, when you are, li you know, when you, are, when you are in intimate situations with people in real moments in their lives. These are people you've known for, not just known, that you've been friends with mm -hmm. for 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, when you say, when you spend seven hours with someone, really you've spent 20 years with yeah, these on and off. patients. I, I pop in on people, you know, like Janie, mm -hmm. as she grew, um, didn't photograph her as much in uh, junior high, because junior high is not a time when you really want the stranger following you around taking pictures like you did when you were eight. Um, um, but it got to the, with the Queen family, you know, they kind of became family as well. You've mentioned Romania, Botswana. Mm -hmm. um, how many countries have you visited uh, over the course of this project? Well, following around the vision of Mark Klein. Okay, the vision of Mark Klein was to, was to do this program in Romania, and if it worked, death rate fell, plummeted the first year they were in operation. That got people's attention. And his vision was to replicate this. 
and you know, and he says it in an interview, um, Africa was the place. I mean, there was a pandemic. There was a, a real desperate need. And so, um, you know, Romania begat Botswana, begat Lesotho and Swaziland, and then Malawi and Uganda, and two in Tanzania, and side programs that were, became offshoots. Um, so in addition to the places where, they, where, where BPI has centers, um, I've also been with them in Libya, where they, they, where they were in consultant. So yeah, I was in Benghazi about six months before America knew Benghazi um, for different reasons. Um, Colombia, you know, so we've been, we've been lots of places where this vision of how to provide care and, and positively impact people's lives has been carried. Dr. Klein mm -hmm. and Baylor, they did not pay for your trips. In the beginning. In the beginning they mm -hmm. helped. For a lot of this, it's been buy your own plane ticket and do it. Um, some of those were because, you know, like one of the kids in Romania, she grew up. When she was a little kid, she said, would ask me if I'd shoot her wedding. And then when she was 20 something, she said, you know, I get word back from a social worker, you know, Narcisse is getting married. And I was like, well, I promised her I'd shoot, his wedding, shoot her wedding because I was just chitty chatting with a kid. Um, and I had to make good on my word. So, you know, my wife is like, yeah. my wife is like, you're going to Romania, why? Well, Narcisse is getting married. She's like, oh, well, Narcisse, you gotta go to her wedding. Because by that point, my wife had uh -huh. gotten to know Narcisse. And so, so there were a lot of just paying for that. Um, but the newspaper gods, kind of, you know, different newsrooms kind of lost interest in this passion project of mine. Um, and it got to a point where the network had gotten so big that, um, that I started pro bonoing some of Baylor's needs. Mm -hmm. They've got a clinic dedication. Will you come shoot our clinic dedication? Well, it's not really something that I'm necessarily gonna be as part of the larger story, um, but you buy the plane, if you cover the expenses, I'll come shoot the thing pro bono, and then I would go off on my own and go see Ingrid and Liam for a couple of days, that sort of thing. And so, yeah, that was, that was one of those ones where that's part of the when you wade into this murky water of your passion versus the hard lines. Mm -hmm. How much do you think you've spent of your own money over the past couple of decades? I was asked this by my spouse. <laughs> at one point a number of, of years back and so I did a rough total in my head um, I don't remember what the exact total was but we looked at it and went well it's a good thing we don't have children of our own because that would have paid for somebody to go to college you've been you've spent the past few months editing these 20,000 photos mm -hmm. going through all of the the history and the time you've spent on this what have you been feeling during that editing time the first thing you feel professionally is you regret the ones you missed. You see the holes. You see that, I wish I'd have done that. I wish I'd have gotten this. You know, those sorts of things. And because if you're critical of your own work, that's the way you look at it. Like, I wish I, had, I wish I had set out with a purpose to like do a book. I wish I had set out with a purpose to do this story. If I had done that, there wouldn't be these gaps that I've got to figure out how to fill. Um, but on the flip side, you know, my editor Marcia and I were looking at pictures yesterday and a picture was resonating, that's something that she'd pulled out of the edit that I had, I didn't even remember shooting. She, it came out of the edit and it was like, I didn't even, it didn't even, it didn't register to me that I'd shot the picture. And then I was like, oh yeah, I like that picture. The why I want to keep doing it was because I knew that I had, just through that action, provided them a mirror with those signposts where they could see how far they had come. And th they didn't even realize themselves until it was put in front of them. I could see it. I watched it from a distance and saw how far they'd come. But, but to the people who were in the trenches, really doing the work, to the patients who were really living their life day to day, um, they had made these great leaps and bounds. And this is what's happened with the whole project. Something that seemed absolutely desperate and unfixable at the beginning. Why the US government did PEPFAR. Why um, President Festus Mohai 
in Botswana said, you know, that this is a, a, a death sentence, that they faced extermination, they faced extinction because of this threat. At that moment in history, it seemed insurmountable. And when you look at the entire body of work and you get to the end and you see healthy children, you, you realize how far everybody came.